everybody. Welcome to New Bethlehem this morning. We're grateful to have you. And as I said before, we're glad to be in the service today. Clap your hands, sing along, let us worship the Lord. And God has allowed us to see another day's journey. Hallelujah. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord, wherever you are in your home, you are in the house of the Lord. You ought to be excited that God brought you into another day and another month. Therefore, with excitement and enthusiasm, let us praise God from whom all blessings flow. God from whom all blessings flow. So 
Praise the Lord, everybody. Again, we are grateful. The Lord has allowed us to see another day's journey. One more month that God has allowed us to see, to enter in this year, 2020. And as challenging as this year has been, God has still allowed us to be able to worship Him, to praise Him. The song they're playing is called, Here I Am to Worship, Here I Am to Bow Down, Here I Am to Say That You're My God. You're all together worthy, all together loving, all together wonderful. And if that's how God is to you, who God is to you, worship Him just in this moment. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my Bibles, wherever you are, turn with us to Genesis chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42, we're going to get, begin reading at verse number 7 and read down to verse number 17. From the New American Standard Bible, you find these words. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, Where have you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. But Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him. Joseph remembered the dream which he had about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. Then they said to him, No, my lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, No, you have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. But they said, Your servants are twelve brothers in all, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. But Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you should not go forth from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you that he may get your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you. But if not, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days. And I want to talk to you this morning from the subject when a generation is tested. When a generation is tested. Father, we thank you as we are in this sacred space at this sacred time for this sacred purpose. We bless you for allowing us to be able to experience worship like never before in your presence. We are humbled by your grace and your mercy, your compassions that are due every morning. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Now as we prepare to hear from you, speak as only you can. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. Liberate us from our own selves to be free to worship you, hear from you. And this your servant asks that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be found acceptable in your sight. For you are my rock and my redeemer. And the people of God said, Amen. If you've been following the last several weeks, you've known that we've been preaching on the patriarchs of faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Recall how we talked about Abraham's challenge when 
Isaac was born and Sarah decided that Ishmael, his first son, had to be put away along with his mother. Then we found in the second saga, as Abraham was preparing to die, how he sent his servant to find a wife for his son Isaac and his servant made a covenant with Abraham and prayed to the Lord and the Lord answered the servant's prayer and the servant was able to bring home a wife, Rebecca, for Isaac. And we found as Isaac and Abraham had died, Isaac had grown up and had been married to his wife for 20 years and they were barren. And Isaac prayed and his wife prayed and before long they bore children of their own. Two nations were within his wife and Jacob and Esau wrestled with each other and they went on about their ways and Jacob grew old and Isaac, Esau grew old and eventually Jacob as we preached last Sunday was sent away and to his mother's land to find a wife and he finds a wife but he has to labor for seven long years and then another seven years eventually winning his wife and leaving that land and reconciling with his brother and Jacob has sons of his own as we come into our text he has sons of his own and he cherishes two sons, Benjamin and Joseph, because they are not only the youngest son, but they were born of his mother, the one that, their mother, the one he, he loved. And we find in our text one of the favored sons, Joseph. And when you read through the Genesis account of Joseph, you find all that he had to endure with his brothers. They face he faced jealousy, he faced anger and bitterness, and they sold him into slavery. He became a servant and was put in jail because of a lie. And then while he was in jail, was dismissed by the ones that he helped get freedom. Eventually, it all paid off in favor for Joseph as he is now, as we arrive in our text, in Pharaoh's court. And he is in Pharaoh's court because of the gifting God had placed on him that allowed him to be able to interpret dreams and dream dreams. The Bible says that God gave Jacob a dream about a famine. And as he had dreams, so the famine happened. And the famine affected his family without him knowing. Eventually, his brothers had to go to their father, Jacob, and say, we have to go to Egypt. We have to go get food, and we must do so with the utmost urgency. He blesses them, and they make it to Egypt, and they come before this person in the text that we read in chapter 42. The Bible says that as they came before them, as they came before Joseph, Joseph immediately recognized them. And as he recognized them, I guess he decided to play a little joke with them. But can you imagine the emotions that may have welled up within Jacob, but then Joseph having seen his brothers for the first time since he was at least 17 years old? having been abandoned by his family, having his father thinking that he was dead, and only wondering how could he help them now. It's amazing to me that jo Joseph looks at his brothers and instead of being angry, and instead of being uh, wanting revenge, he looks at them and he has compassion, but he plays a game with them first. And I know many of us we probably wouldn't be able to do what Joseph did. If we've seen our brothers or someone who wronged us or our sisters or someone who wronged us, we probably want to 
get as much revenge as possible. Matter of fact, in this cancel culture that we're in now, we want to make sure that everything that was ever negative about them came out and made enough people mad and shameful towards them. That's where we are today. But, but Joseph was not there, and Joseph did not do that. Instead, the scripture says that Joseph recognized his brothers and in verse 9, Joseph remembered his dreams. Here's the thing about that I really admire about what, what, what Joseph did. Joseph looks at the people who literally brought harm on his life, who really literally put him away from them, who literally led him down a path of what some would call just bad luck. And here he sees them. And instead of feeling angry and instead of usurping his authority that he had right to use against his own brothers, he remembers his dreams. The significance of that is that he remembered God's hand was on him even when God's, well, God's people were against him. You have to remember sometimes when God's hand is on you, there will be more people against you who will try to dis displace you, who will try to misuse you, who will you, uh, abuse you simply because you had a dream. In our day and age, we only think of one dreamer, and that's just the late great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who so eloquently articulated the dream that he had for his sons and daughters and for the sons and daughters of black men and women and for the sons and daughters of white, win, white men and women. But Joseph remembered the dream that he had for him, that God had showed him that his family would be bowing to him. That God had showed him that his family would be reverencing him. Put a pause there because like, many of, like I said before, many of us would use that to our advantage. Many of us will, will see the advantage point that we have against somebody who did us wrong. Amen, somebody. Y'all, you, you might not think it. You might not say it, but you sure will think it. You sure will say to yourself, man, what could I do? To make this person, I, I, I don't want to make them t feel too bad, but I, I got to let them feel my power, my authority. And yet Jacob, Joseph did not do that. I keep wanting to say Jacob. I don't know why. I keep wanting to say Jacob. Joseph remembered his dream. As he saw his brothers, the first thing that comes to his mind as a teenager is that they hated him. When you recall the story is as, as descriptive in, I believe it's the 37th chapter of Genesis. And, and, and Joseph was favored by his father and his father made him a coat of many colors and his brothers were, uh, they were angry and jealous at that. And then on top of that, he has a dream and has a nerve enough to tell his dream to his brothers and his brothers got even more angry and even more jealous. And it was just one dream. Then he had a second dream. And he gets the same reaction. But this time he tells his father. And his father has a similar reaction to his brothers. You, you mean to tell me that we're going to be bowing down to you? Who are you? You're, you're the youngest. Who, who are you? You're, you're not worth anything. Yes, I, I value your mother and my relationship to you and your brother is a, be, a, a wonderful one. But, but how dare you even imply that you'll be greater than I am. But the scripture says that while the brothers hated and were jealous, Jacob kept the dream alive. You got to get this. Jacob didn't realize why he cherished the dream in spite of the dream affecting him. All he knew is that the dream still meant something to Joseph. And if it meant something to Joseph, it meant something to him. While his brothers 
couldn't stand the dream while his brothers hated him and envied him Jacob looked at Joseph and though the dream was was affecting him Jacob still kept the dream alive kept that dream perhaps even after his brother sold him into slavery and brought this bloody piece of garment back to their father saying we believe he's dead the only thing that he had left aside from that garment was the fact that his son had dreams my God so you got to understand even the father dreams and the Bible says that young men when in this time of the fulfillment of the spirit young men should be dreaming old men should be dreaming people should be dreaming we should have visions of where we will be Jacob had the vision of who he was and he later recounted that to Joseph and 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 but he still held on to Joseph's dream even though Joseph was absent Never forget the dream you have. Never, never forget the dream God places in you. Now, now, I'm not talking about the dream of what you aspire to be. I'm talking about the dream of what God has inspired within you. A dream of abundant life. A dream of eternal life. Reconciled with him through Jesus Christ. Don't lose your dream. And while Jacob looked at them and remembered his dream. Jacob said, I know who you are, and I know where you come, but the reality is, you came, even though you're experiencing the famine, you came because you know that we are not as de well defended as we once were. You, you, you came to scope out our weakness. You, you came to see what, what was really going on to see if you could take advantage of us. Now, 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 it may seem odd to the regular reader why Jacob would say, Joseph would say such a thing and, and, and to the brothers that he knew and to the situation that he knew being aware of the famine that had engrossed the entirety of the land you would think he would not imply any negative thing when, first, when persons are coming to buy from him but instead he says no you, you came, you're coming to see our weak spots. You, you're, you're trying to imply that we are weaker and not stronger because of the famine. But the brothers maintain their humility. It's interesting that these same brothers who were big and bad enough to hate on their younger teenage brother because he had a dream are now grown men and are hung, hungry and humble enough to admit that they're just sons. You got to get this revelation here. The brothers maintained their humility. Although they had already bowed before Joseph without knowing who he was, they recognized that they were just as vulnerable as before when they came to the land. They, they were vulnerable coming in because they were strangers coming in to Egypt and, and, and they were coming with the, with the intent just to purchase food and, and go back to their land and now standing before them having been accused of being spies they are vulnerable to the authority in front of them. Seems like the, the script had been flipped. They realize their humility and they say these words. They say, no, we're not spies. We're just simply sons of one father from Canaan. And again, when the spy is implied, they double down on their humility and they say, no, 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 no. We're, we're not spies. We are 12 sons from one man. Now you can imagine how Joseph may have looked at them. It's only 10 here. You're saying 12. And say, yeah, 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 I, I know it's only 10, but, but here it is. here's the thing. See, our baby brother had to stay home. He's, he's still too young to come with us. Now he's a grown man, but y'all know how it is with some of us grown men. We, you don't matter how old you get, you're still going to be a, a little youngin'. You, you, you're still just, just still wet behind the ears. 
And even though Benjamin was really a, a young adult, he was still just a little kid. And then they're confronted with the truth of who they really are. They say, yes, we are 12. One is home with daddy, and the other one is no longer with us. He's dead. Imagine the emotions welling up within both of them, the brothers, as well as Joseph hearing. To them, he died a long time ago. To him, he died but was resurrected and now stands before them, commanding attention from them, and they still realizing not who he was, acknowledge that they had a hand in recognizing and realizing he was a part of them. They maintain their humility. They maintain their humility. Sam, we understand we've come here at a great cost and a great loss to us. And we don't want to set ourselves short by being accused of something that we're not. A lot of you may identify with these brothers. And while the text is not clear, say, although it reads that they all spoke in unison, we assume they all spoke in unison when doing so, but the oldest really is speaking for all of them. And the oldest is saying, we're not who you think we are. We come here with our hands out. We come here humble, but we're really not who you think we are. We are. We we come here as a group of men, and and yes, we have we have the means of of taking care of our family. We have the means of taking care of our business, but we really are still just broken men. We're still broken men. Then to get to our main text here, Joseph says. By this, you will be tested. I said you are spies. So by this, you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you will not go from this place until your youngest brother comes here. Send one of them, your older brother, send one of them to go, but y'all going to stay here until he comes. And if not, then I'm going to consider you spies. Brings me to my thought. The brothers are tested with making a decision that can impact the rest of their life. The brothers have come to an impasse in the road. As, 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 they, as they talk among themselves, the reality of the challenge set before them is great. Because they have to make a decision on whether to go forward, go home, get him, risking losing another brother, or coming, going back and coming back with that brother in tow. Having already been deemed spies, having already been deemed worthless, have already been deemed judged in their mind by this person who was in authority over them. They give in to the test. We are in an age of testing like never before. You might not feel like you're being tested right now. A lot of us have been, are being tested emotionally. We're being tested psychologically and mentally. We're being tested financially we're being tested all around and, and we're wondering will I make it through this test but I put to you that there's a greater test that's happening a test of a generation a test of a generation that's, that's looking for something that can, they can say that God has promised to us. God has promised good to us. And there's a generation who is 
willing to see, will God bring forth His promise? Surely, the brothers did not know ultimately what would happen because of their tests. They're confined to prison for three days. When then you read through the entirety of the story, they are sent home, they get their goods, they're sent home, and the money that they had paid is given back to them. And when they get home, they realize that they had all the money and they were going to look bad as if they were thieves. They had already been called spies and now it's going to look like they are thieves as well. And they tell the father, once those, those foods run out and they have to return, they tell the father, they say, Father, we got to go back. We still have a brother left there. Simeon is still in prison till we come back. And not only is he in prison, but we have to bring Benjamin with us. We have to bring our, our, our baby brother with us. And we know it's going to wear on you because this is the last remnant that you have. We know it's going to wear on you because you lost Joseph and, 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 and that, that, that teared you apart. And we know it's going to hurt you even more, but we've got to go back. We need the food. We need to be able to provide for our family. We know the risk, but we've got to go back. This is the test of our faith. We believe that when we go we will find justice and they return and they return with Benjamin and, and, and the story goes on not only do they return with Benjamin and they have a great feast eventually Joseph reveals himself and then there's reconciliation my last point is this this generation is being tested to ensure reconciliation. This generation is being tested to ensure reconciliation. Not just racial reconciliation. But reconciliation to the God of this world. Not Satan, but the God who created this world. Not, not the material things, but the God who came and made himself of no reputation. The God who came and dwelt among us. He who knew, knew no, mis, no sin became sin for us. Reconciling us to himself. Through death on the cross. We're in the challenge today to see real Reconciliation. Equity has its place. Equality has its place. All kinds of justice has its place. But what we're really in need now is reconciliation. In so many words, so many ways, this is a recapitulation of Abraham's promise. God's promise to Abraham. This is a sort of like a recapitulation. And when you go through the story and you see the events, going through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now here Joseph and his brothers, and you read all the things in between, it, it's bringing back full circle the, rec the reality that God wanted him to himself. He, he had made a promise, and he was going to fulfill that promise. And we today are now capable of being heirs to that promise. Not so much because of who we are, but because of what he's done. This is a testing time. This is a testing time. But it's a testing time, not because of Corona or COVID. It's a testing time because it's an opportunity for us to be reconciled to God for you to be reconciled with God for, for you to reconnect with the creator this is our prayer for you let's pray Father God just as Joseph saw his brothers and lamented it was re remembered his dream just as his brothers remembered their humility and remembered who they were 
Even in prison, they repented and they remembered what they had done. They were remorseful. And through it all, it led to reconciliation. Even so, in this moment, God, may we be reconciled to you through Jesus Christ, through the one who came, who lived and died, and rose from the dead. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you don't know Jesus in the part of your sins, we extend this invitation to Christian discipleship to you. Come to Jesus just as you are. Come to Jesus. He is able to save you. He loves you. Reconciling you to the Father through himself. This is your opportunity. It's an invitation to Christian discipleship. Come to Jesus just as you are. Amen and amen and amen. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we are grateful to you. We welcome you to the family of Christ. And I also want to take this opportunity now to thank those of you who have been supporting New Bethel. Thank you so much for your gifts, all that you have done. We appreciate you so much. As you've seen across the street. We now come to this time of Holy Communion, the sacrament of the church that's sacred. And whatever elements you may have in your possession, we invite you to join us in this most sacred of all sacraments of the church. The hymn writer said, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. You that do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and the love and charity with your neighbor and intend to lead a new life following commandments of God, draw near with faith. Walking from henceforth in his holy word, draw near with faith and make your humble confession to Almighty God, meekly kneeling. Join us in a general confession. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men. We acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please you in the newness of life to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of your great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto you, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's very meet, right, and our bounden duty, that we shall at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your holy name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to you, O Lord, most high. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood that our sinful souls and bodies may be made clean by his death and washed through his blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen, amen, amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of your tender mercy, they give your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross for our redemption. 
who made thereby his oblation of himself, once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to commit continual perpetual memory of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech you, and grant that we, receiving these your creatures of bread and wine, according to your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night he's betrayed, took bread. When he gave thanks, gave it to the disciples, said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you do in memory of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples, said, This is the blood of the New Testament shed for you for the remission of the sins of the whole world. Take and drink all of it. Do this as often as you do in memory of me. The blessed body of the Lord Jesus Christ broken for me. With thanksgiving I take and feast upon it. The blood of Jesus will never lose its power. The blood, that, the blood that reaches to the highest mountain flows to the lowest valley. I take it with thanksgiving in my heart. May it preserve my soul to everlasting life. And having renewed my covenant, I rise with thanksgiving on my lips and praise in my heart. My brothers and sisters, let us pray as the Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give to us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses, as we do the same for others. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory, all yours now and forever. Amen. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we, your humble servants, desire your fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching you to grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. Here we offer and present unto you, O oh Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto you. Humbly beseeching you, all we are partakers of this most holy communion, may be filled with your grace and heavenly benediction. And although we be unworthy through our manifold sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we beseech you to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Christ our Lord, by whom, with whom, and the Holy Spirit, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be unto you, O Father, Almighty, world without end and after they had feasted they fellowship with one another i invite you to do that same do the same today wherever you may be fellowship with your loved one fellowship with your brother and sister and now as we close out this first sunday may god's peace and love of the Father and of the Son. May the blessed communion of his Holy Spirit be with all of you now and always. Lord bless you and keep you. Amen and amen.